The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the ninth chapter. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When Jesus' disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But he said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Wow, if the text that we had last week was, and you remember this text, we had demons and demons going into pigs and pigs jumping off of a cliff. If that one was weird, and it was, <laughs> this week's text is one that makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable because it's very demanding of any of us who would follow Jesus. It's about commitment. It's about radical commitment to Jesus. It's about leaving our former way and or our comfortable way of life behind. And it exposes us. It exposes me for making excuses as to why I don't want to follow Jesus so radically, at least not right now. This text also makes me a bit uncomfortable, uncomfortable because Jesus comes off looking like, well, he's a bit uncaring about other people's priorities and commitments to something good like family. Jesus just doesn't sound nice. Someone came up to Jesus and said, I will follow you wherever you go. And isn't that the response that Jesus would want from any of us? I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. But instead of saying, great, or your faith has made you well, or welcome to the most meaningful life you will ever experience, Jesus says something about foxes having holes and Birds of the air having nests, but the Son of Man having nowhere to lay his head? You know, at first glance, it seems to me that Jesus needs some lessons here in carrying conversations. Something like peer ministry training or something like that. <laughs> And then Jesus commands someone else. The first one was a volunteer, right? I'll follow you, Lord. The second one is Jesus commands, follow me. And that's the command that Jesus speaks to each and every one of us. And this person seems, oh, so ready. He just needs to go and bury his dad. Sounds reasonable, right? Then Jesus, Mr. Not-So-Nice Guy, says, let the dead bury their own dead. Ouch. Sounds to me like Jesus needs to take that Dale Carnegie course. What is that? How to win friends and influence people? He could take some lessons if he asked me. That third person then is another volunteer. I will follow you. It's as though he's saying the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. We don't like that song in the Lutheran church very much because of, you know, decision and things like that. But anyways, I've decided to follow Jesus. All he needs to do is go home. He just wants to go home and say goodbye to his family. Again, if you ask me, 
sounds pretty reasonable. But Jesus, continuing this difficult and uncomfortable pattern, says something like, no one plowing a field can look backwards. Not even to say goodbye to loved ones? I want to look at these three seemingly unkind and uncaring episodes in our Lord's life. The first one, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now that sounds a little confusing to most of us, I would think. It sounds a little bit cryptic. Foxes, birds, what's that have to do with anything? Well, the people who first heard Jesus speak these words, certainly the people who first read Luke's account of Jesus' life, for them it wasn't so cryptic. They would have understood what we typically don't understand. Foxes refers to King Herod. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus says, Go tell that fox Herod. And birds of the air? Well, that's a symbol of the Roman Empire. Just like the eagle is a symbol of the United States, the eagle was a symbol of the Roman Empire, the occupying Roman Empire. I don't think Jesus was trying to be any, any way, in shape, or form to be cryptic. He was referencing the ways of the world. So what can we make of this? With that background of birds and foxes. Try this on for size. If you want to follow me, says Jesus, my paraphrase, you're going to be walking and living counterculturally. What I mean is you've got the ways of the world on the one hand. You know, Herod, that fox, or the occupying Roman Empire, the birds of the air. And going along with them might be the easier way and the more comfortable way. So you've got the ways of the world on the one hand, and you've got the ways of Jesus on the other hand. And the ways of Jesus might not be as comfortable as the ways of the world. You follow Jesus, there are no comfy pillows for you. There's a cost. There's a sacrifice. A sacrifice for discipleship. But as soon as I say that, I get uncomfortable again and maybe even a bit ashamed. Look around and you tell me where you see sacrifice. Most of us gathered here this morning have it pretty easy. Most of us gathered here this morning have more than we really need to make it through life, right? Most of us, I would argue, are very welcomed in and comfortable going with the flow of our culture. If there's a cost to discipleship, and if I'm not paying that cost of discipleship, maybe I'm not living so counterculturally. May I, maybe I'm walking with culture and society rather than with Jesus. You see why this text, this whole, this whole lesson is making me feel uncomfortable this morning? But we hear that no matter the cost, we are to set our faces on Jesus, just as Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And we know the high cost for Jesus in Jerusalem. The cost is high when we follow Jesus. It's one thing that we can learn today, at least from that first would-be follower. The second is that the time to follow Jesus is now. When this second would-be follower of Jesus uh, says, yes, I'll follow, he's so ready, but he says, let me first go and bury my father, Jesus sounds cold and even cruel. When he says, let the dead bury their own dead. Until we understand a little bit more what's going on here. It is very unlikely that this guy's dad is already dead. 
If his, dad's de- if his dad would have been dead already, this man would have been with the mourners. There was a whole system of mor- and cultural uh, uh, pattern and habits of mourning that you just did. So if the guy's dad is dead, he wouldn't have been following Jesus at the time. No, 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 no. What he's saying is that, you know what, Jesus, I need to continue serving my dad until such time as my dad dies. And that might be 20 days from now, or 20 weeks from now, or 20 years from now. If that's the case, you'll be 101. Uh, I need to serve my dad for all that time. And then when I'm done with those kind of responsibilities, then I'll follow you, Jesus. And Jesus wasn't having that. Following Jesus is not supposed to be when it comfortably fits into our lives or our schedule. I don't know about you, but again, this is hitting pretty close and it's making me pretty uncomfortable again. How many of us have thought, not now, but later? That's when I'll get around to this following Jesus thing. Not now, but later is when I'll get around to this tithing thing. Not now, but later is when I'm going to get around to, you know, reading the Bible or being part of a Bible study. Not now, but later is when I'm going to join the choir. Choir's off for the summer. You're off the hook. Uh, Or step forward to be a leader in vacation Bible school. That's not hypothetical. That is coming up. Or to step forward to become a leader in Sunday school. That too is coming up. No, no, not now, but maybe later. Uh, Not now. I'm not going to support Habitat for Humanity now. Not even in writing a blessing down on a two-by-four. Oh, please, I want all of you to write a blessing on those two-by-fours or two-by-sixes. Now is the time. So do that. Not now, but maybe later I'll, like, take this whole Jesus thing seriously. (laughs) Jesus is calling you, and Jesus is calling me, to follow him and to serve him now. (laughs) Yes, now is the time. The thing in this third passage or the third follower that we can learn is that when we follow Jesus, we need to make a definite break with the past. We need to make a break with the past. We need to let go of and turn away from our former way of life, our former values, our former priorities, our former addictions, and to move forward with Jesus. The person who wanted to go back and say goodbye to the family, well, that sounded like he was making a very reasonable request. Until we know that that word, say goodbye, elsewhere in Scripture, the other five times it's used... It's translated to take leave of his family. And to take leave of somebody has the sense of asking permission. May I leave now? And Jesus knew and everybody knew that there was no way that this guy's dad or family would say, yeah, you go chase after this itinerant preacher and just neglect us. Go on your way. Blessings to you. No. So Jesus says that weird statement about no one plowing a field can look back. And why? I don't farm, but you know, I've seen hand plows. I was actually going to bring one here. So in your mind, have a plow here that you walk behind, all right? And uh, if I'm plowing and look back, my I'm going to go doing this all through the field, and then that's not going to work very well, and I'm going to go crossing furrows and all the rest. No, no, you got to look forward. You got to keep your eyes forward, and you got to break with the past. So let me ask you this question. What might you need to break with? What might you need to leave behind so that you can more fully follow Jesus? You know, it might be something like, it gets a little touchy here. It might be 
acquaintances. It might be habits. It might be addictions. It might be other kinds of ways of life. It might even be a career so that you can keep your eyes focused on Jesus. A career. Our first Bible reading that Brenda read had something to do about that. We had Elisha, who was called to replace Elijah. And did you see what he did? He, he cut ties with the past. He was a farmer, and he slaughtered the oxen, and he burned the plows. Guess he's breaking with the past. We're going to do this new task now. You and I may be called to something similar, not to kill the calves or the oxen. But what in our life do we need to walk away from so that we can follow Jesus? This is a difficult, uncomfortable text. So what are we to do? Well, the easy answer, or it's not easy, there's nothing easy about it. The simple answer is to make that commitment to be that fully devoted follower of Jesus. We need to set our faces on Jesus. And yet I know that my sinful self gets in the way of me fully following Jesus. And if it's the case with me, it's probably the case with some of you as well. And it is then, it is precisely then, and it's a lot of the time that we need to go again to Jesus and to own up to our failures and our mixed up priorities. And we need to believe boldly that that's exactly why Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Because it was in Jerusalem that Jesus died on the cross at the hands of all the hate that could be thrown at him. And it was in Jerusalem that God raised Jesus from the dead, defeating even the power of death, but also including everything that would hold you or me down or back. And then as we boldly believe in and experience that forgiveness freely given, we are called again and again and again to follow him. We're given the opportunity again and again to set our faces on him and to live our lives in radical commitment to him and to his ways. Simple but not easy. A lot to learn from in this Bible passage, but it's tough and it's uncomfortable. But God never promised that it would be easy. God promised that he would be with us, however, each and every step of the way. Jesus said, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We cling to that. He promises also that if and when we live in the reality of God's love, you and I will experience what I thought Jesus was going to say to that first person. Welcome to the most meaningful life you could ever imagine. And that is true. Amen.